We're going to be in Romans chapter 1 today, and so if you want to go to Romans chapter 1, go there now. <clears throat> If you don't have a Bible with you, you should be able to find one in uh, the uh, uh, chair racks in front of you. And if you don't know where to find things in the Bible, you should be able to find this on page 939 of uh, the, uh, the Bibles that are in the chair rack. I always write down the page number of where we're going to be because I, think, I always think it's going to be an easy thing for me to remember the page number. And then I get up here and I completely blank on the page number. So for those of you who need the page number, it's 939... Excuse me, of Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> I read a, a biography of Andrew Jackson uh, early this summer. Uh, living in or near Jacksonville, I thought it would be a good thing to read a little bit about Andrew Jackson and find out uh, what kind of a person he was and the kind of person that our great city was named after. How do you get to know somebody that, li that died over 150 years ago? Uh, how, do you, how can you feel like you really understand who they are? Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, one of the things that we can do is look at the things that they've written. And Andrew Jackson left behind a lot of letters. Uh, as a president of the United States, he let, left behind uh, a lot of his policies, uh, which were um, heartbreaking in many regards and good in some other regards. Another thing that you can do to find out what kind uh, of character a person has is to study their actions. And in fact, actions are a great revealer of character, aren't they? The, uh, the Bible says in Proverbs that we're to guard our hearts, for from the heart is the wellspring of life. And in fact, the, the person that we are in our interior drives our actions. It's our, our character is displayed by what we say and by what we do. And as with any historical figure, anybody that you read a biography about, there's always a gap, isn't there, between the person that we are inside or that we want to be inside and the person that we actually are. Sometimes Andrew Jackson did better than he believed. And we can all be thankful for, for those cases in our lives where we act better than what our hearts are. But oftentimes we have intentions, good intentions, that never actually make it into action. I'm not the kind of dad that I want to be. I'm not, the, the husband I am is different from the husband I want to be. The pastor that I actually am is not the pastor that I intend to be. Because in all of us, for every great historical figure or for just us as individuals, there is always somewhat of a gap between our intentions and who we actually are and what we actually display. But actions reveal character. God is not like a man or a woman. Because with God, there is absolutely no gap between his attributes, his character, and what he does. For every other person on planet Earth, there's a, there's a gap between those two things. But for God, God's character is always perfectly displayed in his actions. God's intentions are always perfectly carried out in his works. There is no gap between God's intentions, his character, and what he does. And if we want to understand God, if we want to understand what God is like, then we need to look, in part, to understand that, of, of, of what God has displayed himself to be, the things that he has done in the world that he has created. <coughs> And I would contend that nowhere is God's character more brilliantly displayed than in the message of the gospel. The gospel puts on brilliant display the many-faceted character of God. It shows us God's attributes like nothing else can. It is a perfect display of God's character and his actions. But what is the gospel? 
For some of us, sometimes the gospel is a slippery term. When I do membership interviews with people sometimes who are seeking to join our church, one of the questions that I ask is, what is the gospel? Can you define the gospel in a sentence or two? And you would be surprised how many people have a nebulous understanding of the gospel. They, they, they have a general understanding of it. They understand believing in God, but it's, it's hard to nail down. So let's start this series with a good, succinct definition of the gospel. I read several gospel definitions over the past couple of weeks from theologians who died long ago to, to pastors and theologians who are alive today. And I found this one very succinct definition that I want to put up on the screen for you and read to you. This one is from John Piper, and here's his definition of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is the good news that Christ died for our sins and was raised from the dead. What makes this good news is that Christ's death accomplished a perfect righteousness before God and suffered a perfect condemnation from God both of which are counted as ours through faith alone, so that we have eternal life with God in the new heavens and the new earth. Now you say, wow, that's, that's, that's the short definition of the gospel that you found. But yes, that is actually one of the shorter definitions of the gospel that I found, and it fits all in one screen, and it hits a lot of the high points. It hits Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, what, that, what necessitated that death, how we're to respond to it, and the end goal of us having eternal life with God forever in heaven. Now, as I said, the gospel message reveals several attributes of God. It reveals facets of his character and puts them on brilliant display to us. And so over the course of the next four weeks, we are going to look at the God revealed by the gospel. We are going to look what the Bible has to say about how the gospel points back to God and tells us what he is like, what is important to him. Three of those attributes of God are come from the very first chapter of Romans. And so you should be in Romans chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans chapter 1. Let's read verses 16 to 18 together. The Bible says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... That's the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Just in reading these three verses, you can see three aspects of God's character, attributes of God that the gospel shows us about him. The gospel reveals God's power. The gospel reveals God's wrath. The gospel is a revelation of God's righteousness. And then we're going to see in Romans chapter 8 that the gospel reveals God's glory. So over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to take a look at each one of those. We're going to look at God's power and how the gospel reveals his power. We're going to look at his wrath. We're going to look at his righteousness. And we're finally, we're going to conclude with how the gospel puts God's glory on brilliant display. But the big idea this week is this. The gospel reveals God's power. The gospel reveals God's power. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, which we just read, says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. So the gospel is a revelation of God's power. It is not the only revelation of God's power. It is not the first revelation of God's power. There have been other manifestations of God's power prior to our full understanding of the gospel. One of those is found in the very next verses of Romans chapter 1. Look with me at verse 18. 
Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. The Bible is telling us that there is an aspect of God's power that has been on display since the creation of the world that is accessible to all people everywhere. Regardless of the time period that you live in, regardless of the amount of scientific knowledge that, you may, that, that a civilization may have had, regardless of the region of the planet that you have inhabited, there is something of God's power that has always been on display. And all people everywhere, the Bible tells us, can clearly see it. God's power has been on display all time, for all time, the Bible tells us, in the things that have been made. So the created world is, is saying something about God to all people everywhere. It's giving all people everywhere information about God. And one of the things that can be seen from the world that we inhabit is the power of God. The theological term for this is general revelation. It is general revelation. It is information that has been revealed to the general public. It's available to all people who have the ability to perceive the world that they live in. And the Bible says that it has been clearly perceived the things that God has made reveal his power. Take the sun, for instance. The sun is the largest object in our solar system. Its diameter is 864,400 miles across. So if you were going to drill a hole in the sun from one side to the other, that would be an 864,000-mile journey. You can fit 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. That's how massive it is. The core of the sun, and it is beyond me how anyone could measure this, because my thermometers don't go this high. But somehow... They say that the core of the sun is 27 million degrees. And living in Florida, I can attest to that. <laughs> the sun is 93 million miles from Earth. The sun is absolutely essential for sustaining life on our planet. The sun is, is more massive than really it's possible to comprehend. I mean, we, can, we hear 1.3 million Earths can fit in the sun. That tells us it's big, but it's just almost incomprehensible how large it is. And God made that thing. And you know what? He didn't break a sweat when he made it. And the sun is nothing compared to another large star, Betelgeuse, which is 700 times bigger and 14,000 times brighter. And there are objects like this all over our solar system and other solar systems and solar systems beyond them, things that we've never seen or dreamed or imagined of, and God made all of it. That is a massive demonstration of power. We just experienced Hurricane Irma, in case you weren't aware of that. <laughs> Sometimes I just get paid to say the obvious. Irma was 650 miles wide. So to put that, put that in perspective, that storm spanned from Savannah, Georgia to New Orleans, Louisiana. That's the kind of distance that we're talking about. 
Irma sustained winds of 185 miles per hour for 37 hours straight. And God's in charge of the weather. God could hold that hurricane in the palm of his hand like a toy. You cannot live in God's world and not witness God's power. Isaac Watts wrote a hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. And he says, There's not a plant or flower below but makes his glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from his throne. Humanity, the Bible tells us, is without excuse when it comes to an awareness of God's power. Without excuse. We can see the power of God, but we suppress the truth. We seek other ways to explain that power. We come up with other origins for that power. We attribute the power of the sun or the power of the hurricane to time and chance, or we, or we worship created things rather than the one who created them. <coughs> and though... And thus, though the power of God is evident for us in general revelation, revelation that's open to the general public, general revelation, the Bible tells us, only serves to condemn us. It is the power of God on display, but for condemnation. But the gospel reveals God's power in a unique and saving way. It reveals the power of God for salvation. Now, I'm afraid that we often reduce the word salvation to the time when our hearts were first changed. When we read that verse and we think about the power of God unto salvation, we think about the time when we were saved. We think about that in the past tense. And that is correct. But when the Apostle Paul, the human author who wrote these words, says that this is the power of God for salvation, he wasn't just referring to the time, whether you're aware of what that time is or not, when you were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He's not just referring to the time where you repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ. He's not just referring to salvation in the past tense. What I'm afraid we often do when we read about the power of God to salvation is we, is we think the power of God for conversion. And so we think of the power of God in the past tense exclusively. But when the Apostle Paul in the Scripture refers to salvation, it's not referring to simply to something that occurred at some past time in our lives. It's referring to our past salvation. It's referring to the power of God presently saving us. And it's referring to the future experience of the power of God by which we will be finally saved. And when, so, Paul, so when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the power of God of salvation, he's referring to the whole thing from start to finish, past, present, and future. And so in the remaining time that we have today, I'd like to think about God's power in salvation in those three categories, past, present, and future. The first thing we see from Scripture is that God's power has saved us from our past. God's power has saved us from our past. Romans chapter 1 gives a description of humanity that, a, a, a humanity that clearly sees God's power, but refuses, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but, ex, but refuses to acknowledge that power. Here's the description in verses 28 to 32. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. 
They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. In just a few weeks' time, we're sending a team of, of, of missionaries from our church to Brazil. I'm going to be staying beyond that team to speak at a conference at a church in Brazil after everyone else comes back. And one of the things that they asked me to do just in the past couple of weeks is to send them my bio. And I have, I always cringe uh, when people ask me to send my bio because my bio is, is super boring. It's basically, yep, there, there he is. He exists. <laughs> Um, but they, so I, I, I pulled some stuff from our website, and the bio helps you get to know me a little bit, and so we'll say things like, I am um, married to Erica, we've got four children, um, I went to school at a particular place, I'm a pastor at a particular church, and before I came here, I was a pastor at another church. That's the information that fills out my extremely thrilling bio. But if I'm honest... And if they were asking for this, if they wanted me to send a spiritual biography of my past accomplishments, then Romans 1, 28 to 32 would be a pretty good description of things I've done. I went back and read Romans 28 to 32 in hopes that I could identify something in there that I was not guilty of. And I read through it twice, and I had to conclude that there was nothing in that description of a godless life that I have not been guilty of. I have committed every single sin on that list. That describes my heart before Jesus. If you're honest, that's your spiritual bio too. Maybe you're not as bad as me. Maybe there are three of those that you could cross off the list that you're not guilty of. But our coveting, envying, oh man, envying, coveting, that's a good one for Americans. Our coveting, envying, lying, gossiping, prideful, spiritual biographies are smeared and caked with sin. Now, thank God we're not all as bad as we could be. You're not as bad as you could be, and I'm not as bad as I could be, and that's God's grace to all of us. But none of us get to wear the name tag of righteous. Okay, we, we may be able to comparatively come out ahead of certain people at certain times, but none of us can wear the name tag of righteous. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And again, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if, if this is my spiritual biography... If this is your spiritual biography, what is going to take away those stains of sin? What's going to wipe that spiritual biography clean? What's, gonna, what's going to, to make it so that God does not count your lying tongue against you? What is it that God is, is going to make God not count your prideful heart against you? What is it that's going to make it so that God does not hold your envying heart against you constantly wanting something more that someone else has? What's going to do that? And the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. <coughs> With a spiritual biography like I have, and a spiritual biography that you have, it would take the power of a God who could create a sun that is 27 million degrees hot. It would take that kind of power to cleanse you of your sin. It would take the power of a God who rides the storm, who can hold a storm in his hand, who can dismiss a hurricane that caused devastation all over our country, all over the islands leading up to us, with the flick of his wrist. It would take that kind of power to dismiss your sins and to forgive you. And the gospel says that that is the kind of power the gospel has. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because its power never fails. There's no person that the gospel doesn't work for. There's no person whose spiritual biography is too smeared and stained with sin. The gospel reveals God's power to save us from our past. The gospel reveals God's power to, to separate your sin from his sight as far as the east is from the west and to bury it in the bottom of the sea. And friends at CBC, this is not some, this is, this is something that we can shout about. This is something that you can clap about. Sometimes I think that we sit in, in church and we hear these great truths and we're so concerned with a little bit of decorum that we think, what an excellent theological point. <laughs> I'm serious. If you can't get excited and clap about something that, but like that and shout about something like that, then there's something wrong with you because your spiritual biography has been wiped clean by the power of God. Amen. That is something to get excited about. So let's get excited. Let's not just sit and think, excellent point. <laughs> You're not doing that, but sometimes that's the way I sit in church. Excellent point. I don't know why I become English when I do that. <laughs> it's better to just stick to the notes. <laughs> But I, I say that, I remind you of this, because so many of us are carrying around that ball and chain of our past sin like this. It's around our ankle. Everywhere we go, we carry it. The Bible tells us that the power of God, that past sin, that, that has been wiped clean, that ball and chain has been cut. You're not carrying it around anymore. We can see secondly that God's power is saving us in the present. It's not just a past tense thing that we can look fondly back to at that one time we experienced God's power. God's power is saving us in the present. The Bible speaks of our experience of the power of God and salvation in the present tense. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, which we already read today, says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved. Who are being saved? It is the power of God. The cross doesn't seem much like a display of power, does it? I mean, if you were going to highlight something that displays the power of God like nothing else, would you naturally choose the cross? The cross seems like, like God is at lowest. The cross seems like Satan's power and strength at its highest. The, power, the cross seems like a manifestation of weakness and it was perceived as a manifestation of weakness when Jesus was hanging on it and people were taunting him that if he was who he said he was to get on down off of there. But Jesus didn't do it. He appeared weak. The cross seems like foolishness. You mean to tell me that we're saved by trusting in the death of God's Son 
a bloody religion. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Those who have put their faith in what the world regards as foolishness experience the power of the cross in ongoing and life-giving ways. Now, I wish we had time to talk about several of those ways, but I'm just going to mention a couple of them. The first one is found in Paul's prayer in Colossians 1, verses 10 and 11. <coughs> Paul is going to talk about God's power and its availability to us in our fight against sin. Colossians 1, 10, and 11 says this. This is a prayer that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. See, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that, the, that believers in Christ can experience resurrection power in something beyond the past tense. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that Christians can experience resurrection power in their daily lives, and that should come as welcome news. And the reason it should come as welcome news is because you, I happen to know, because I know myself as well, and the Bible shines the light on all of us, are struggling with sin. And there are some sin habits that you can't seem to kick. And you know what those habits are. And maybe the people around you know what those habits are. And maybe the people around you don't know what those habits are. But all of us are in a battle in life. It is a struggle against sin. And we sometimes feel like, I guess sin is stronger than Jesus. And that's why we need to not rely on our experience because the urges of sin feel so strong at times. They feel like it's impossible to overcome them at times. And that's when we need to have our minds illuminated by the scripture to believe that God can strengthen us with all power so that we bear fruit in every good work, so that we endure suffering with joy, so that we are strengthened to obey God and please God. God. That resurrection power is available. And so I want to say this to those of us, which is all of us, who are struggling with sin this morning, don't give up. Don't resign yourself to the fact that you're born this way and you're just going to be this way. That is a lie. You don't have to be that way. Now, I'm not saying that if we, if we, if we come to Jesus and we, say, we tell him that we know his power is available to us, Jesus will give us this magic wand experience where all of a sudden that, that, that urge of sin is going to just magically disappear. He does that for some people in some areas, and thank God he does. But part of Christian life is putting to death the deeds of the sinful nature. It's strapping on your sword every day and going to battle. And you will grow discouraged strapping that sword on every morning unless you believe that what the Bible says is true and your feelings are false. Because your feelings tell you that you'll never win. The Bible tells you that you can be strengthened with resurrection power because you are being saved. There's another experience, present experience of God's power. <laughs> it's found in Ephesians 3, verses 16 to 19. <clears throat> Once again, this is a prayer. If you just read verse 16, it says, this is a prayer that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, if you just pause there and say, okay, guess, if you didn't already know what was coming, guess what the next thing it is, we would think 
probably, that God's strength is coming us so that we can do something. But God's power that's available to us is not just strength to do things, it's strength to know and believe things. So verse 17 picks up. He's, he's praying that you may be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So I, I love talking about this passage of Scripture, and I talk about it all the time because I think we just miss it sometimes. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, is praying that the believers would have power to know and believe something. He wants them to know and believe that Christ loves them far more than they could possibly have ever imagined. God wants you this morning as a believer to know and believe that Christ loves you more than you think. Because love for us is a conditional commodity, even for the people who are closest to us. Baby, there are some conditions on that love. But God doesn't love the way we love. God's love for us is not conditioned on our performance for him because God's love for us is, is given to us through the work of Christ. And God wants you to know and believe this morning, despite whatever's happened this week, that God loves you far more than you actually believe. And you need his power to believe and trust that whether it seems to be true or not. There's a third way the gospel reveals God's power. It shows us that it saved us from our past. It is saving us in the present. And finally, God's power will save us in the future. 1 Peter 1 tells us that we have, as Christians, an inheritance waiting for us. And that inheritance waiting for us, the Bible describes it as something that is imperishable. It's not something that's going to spoil. It's undefiled. It's unfading. There's, no, there's, there's nothing that can take away from it or spoil it or diminish its value. This is the inheritance that is waiting those who belong to Jesus. I recently read a story about a, an heiress in New York City. She was the granddaughter, I think, of uh, a, a politician and businessman in the early 20th century who had made a fortune. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. And this woman uh, was a somewhat of a strange woman. Uh, she did not like the limelight at all. She, tried, she did everything she could to stay out of the public eye. She owned estates in California, in Connecticut, four apartments in Manhattan. I mean, she owned millions and millions of dollars in real estate. The, the estate that she owned in Connecticut, uh, if, it, from a bird's eye view, has these immaculately kept gardens. But for the, the last 20 years of her life, she opted instead to live at a hospital. She lived at a hospital for 20 years under an assumed name to hide her identity while all this army of people kept up these multiple properties. And when she finally passed away, she left her fortune, which was over $300 million, to various... Uh, interests of hers. There were very few living relatives and even the very few living relatives were very distant. But one of her distant relatives, name was, his name was Timothy Gray, 
was set to receive a small percentage of her family fortune. That small percentage was worth $19 million. And so her attorneys went to find Timothy Gray to tell him the good news that he had won a very small fraction of her fortune that totaled $19 million. They searched for a while and they finally found Timothy Gray. He was in Wyoming. And when they found him, he was frozen to death under a railroad trestle. Homeless. An heir of $19 million. Something that would have changed his life dramatically and he never saw a penny of it. That isn't going to happen to us. That inheritance that awaits us in heaven, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1, by, uh, 1 Peter 1 5, it's waiting for those who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now this puts our faith and God's power together in the same sentence in a wonderful way because we need to keep on hanging on to Christ. We need to keep our faith in Christ to trust in Him, to trust in nothing else. But you know what's ultimately guarding us? God's power. And you are going to see every last bit of what's coming to you. You are going to experience the grace of God for an eternity. You are going to be with the God who can create suns and can create stars and can create galaxies. You are going to spend an eternity who wiped your slate clean and gave you a spiritual biography that is filled with the righteousness of Christ. And he has not only gone beyond that, he could have stopped there and that would have been enough, but he he said, I want you to spend eternity with me and I have an inher inheritance waiting for you and you are being guarded by faith for an inheritance that's undefiled, unfading, unperishing. You are going to get there. Amen. That same power that Je raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise us as well. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. You see, Jesus is in the process, King Jesus is in the process of having all things put under His feet. There's nothing in this vast, grand creation that Jesus has made that is not going to be submitted to the lordship and kingship of Jesus. And the same power that can take a world full of rebel sinners and a, and a, and a, a creation that seems at times to be out of control, the same God's, power of God that can make all that submit is the power that is going to raise your body up out of the grave. And it's going to transform that broken body that you inhabit right now and the broken experiences of life that you have now. And he is going to make it like his glorious body. In other words, you are going to be like Jesus. And we're going to be able to look at each other without shame and say, you are like Jesus, and we're going to be able to have somebody say that back to us, and it's, we're going to be able to receive that because it's true. Wow. You're getting saved. Only God's power could do that. There are, as we close, no doubt people here this morning who have never experienced God's power like that. <coughs> the verses that I read from Romans chapter 1 might be a very good description of your life. And you may be one who not only does that, but rejoices with others who do.
The Bible tells us that people who do that are deserving of God's wrath. We're deserving of death. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the good news that God's power has never been more on display than it was on the cross. Because to worldly eyes, a sign of weakness, God was actually accomplishing the defeat of sin and death. God was actually accomplish, accomplishing the redemption of a broken, sinful people that he would bring to himself. And God proved it three days later when he raised Jesus from the dead. Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God. And Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that it is the power of God unto salvation to who? To those who simply believe. And so the gospel is a message that carries with it an invitation. It demands a response. Will you receive the Christ who bled and died and rose triumphant? Will you humble yourself and repent of your sin and put your faith in that Christ? If you do, the Bible says that that caked bio wiped clean. You will be saved. And you will experience God's power as you are being saved. And you will be safely conveyed to your final salvation. Let's pray.